All right, welcome to Linux Fest um, after lunch. Um, so this is going to be Jonathan Wright, and uh, his talk will be uh, from zero to everywhere. Alma Linux's high-speed mirrorless evolution: um, what the AI revolution means for open source, open tech, and open societies. Hey, so my name is Jonathan Wright. I'm currently the CTO at Nonhost, uh, the infrastructure lead at Alma Linux, and I've been involved in Fedora packaging for a couple of years now. And this is my first time presenting at a conference, so uh, wish me luck. Hopefully this goes well. Um, we're going to be talking about the Alma Linux mirror system, which has had quite an evolution over the past few years. Um, Back in 2021, when Alma Linux started up, we basically started out with just a single server serving uh, serving everything. It was um, serving the updates, and at the time, just um, you know, beta beta software. It wasn't Alma Linux wasn't released yet. Um, this wasn't going to scale long term at all. The the mirrors.almalinux.org was again just serving that one server that was serving everything handled a few thousand hits per hour with no problem um there were multiple problems with that setup though obviously that wasn't going to scale there was no redundancy uh the users could be very far from the download server so they could have slow uh downloads for updates or you know the initial download of you know an iso image or a cloud image that's obviously not good for anybody so from that, where we are today is we've got a network of over 350 mirrors worldwide. We serve nearly a million Alma Linux installs every single month. Um, we're processing about three quarters of a million requests per hour to our, our mirror list. It's set up to automatically uh, scale horizontally and basically everything is, is running great. We see consistent growth every month and the system, we're, we're constantly improving it and, and adding updates. So how did we get from point A to point B? Um, let's go back to February of 2021, which is about a month after Alma Linux was initially announced. Uh, we announced in, in January, and then in February is kind of when we got things started. We, we set up the initial mirror system. It had very little logic. It was serving a list of public mirrors, uh, Two mirrors at the time is what we started with, that initial one server, and then one other organization stepped up to contribute one. That was at the beginning of February. By the end of February, we already had 32 mirrors. That's before we even had a, uh, a stable Alma Linux release. So things are already going really right for us. We've got a bunch of people contributing, even just in the, the few weeks after we initially announced Alma Linux. Going forward to March of 2021, we're up to 54 total mirrors by the end of the month, which is a very, very healthy number uh, for where we were at the time, but the system was still dumb. And by that, I mean, we're just serving a, a static list of mirrors, basically throwing it out there. There's no checking for if a mirror is online, if it's fast, uh, is it close to you, anything like that. The end of March of 2021, uh, we release Alma Linux 8.3 stable. That was the very first version of Alma Linux. So looking at the next few months, uh, April to June of 2021, Alma Linux is growing. Uh, you know, everything is looking good. We're growing rapidly. By the end of May, we have Alma Linux 8.4 released, which is, you know, just a couple of months after 8.3. Uh, one of our lead, uh, our, our lead architect at the time and still currently Andrew was a, an absolute machine managing our mirror list by hand. And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like in the next slide. Um, by the end of July, we had 128 mirrors. So Andrew being a machine, uh, here's what that looks like. Here's a, a git commit that he made. And I don't know how well this shows on the projector there, but if you look at it, there's a, a line per version, a line per repository, and a line per architecture. And he's managing this all by hand, adding and removing, uh, you know, to this list, which again has no uh, automatic checking for is a mirror up, is it down, is it out of sync. All this is being done by hand, and it's getting a bit unwieldy because, uh, as I mentioned in the last slide, we're we're well over a hundred mirrors now. So let's fast forward a little bit to July of 2021, and this is where we have the initial release of. Um, 
we'll we'll say the current and modern mirrorless system. We start putting in some automatic checks. We start uh, adding geolocation aware data to where we can serve mirrors that are close to users. Uh, we base this on MaxMind's geolocation data. Um, remember that. We're going to come back to that later. We've got basic mirror status checks, so we know if a mirror is up, we know if a mirror is down, and we can automatically add and remove that from the list being served to users. Andrew gets to take a break now. He can focus on much more important things than uh, you know playing mirror basket toss-up, adding and removing mirrors nonstop. So we'll go forward a little bit more. We've got a lot of things going at this point. Uh, the mirror system is really starting to develop between August and October of 2021. We add ASN and subnet pinning. What that allows people to do, if you run a mirror, uh, either public or private, you can direct traffic to your own mirrors without modifying the repo files on your servers. Um, the way we do that is in the mirror configs in Git, we can uh, list ASNs or subnets that should be served by your mirror. And the mirror list will automatically serve uh, your mirror first when we get requests from those subnets or from those ASNs. We also added uh, cloud provider pinning. And what that will let us do is within a given cloud provider, um, currently we support Azure and AWS, we can serve traffic from within those networks. Not only does that make it faster for those users, it saves on um, external uh, traffic billing because we're again, serving that traffic within that cloud. So we started that with Azure back in 2021. Uh, recently during 2023, we actually added AWS as well. So both of those clouds have incredibly good uh, internal mirroring of Alma Linux now to where you're saving on those bandwidth costs and you're getting the updates extremely, extremely fast uh, when you kick those off. We started running into some problems with uh, scalability. And this is kind of the first, first time we start seeing where the way that we built the system is becoming problematic in that the, the checks that we do to verify mirror status can't keep up. We're getting so many mirrors that that, that single threading is becoming a problem. So we start adding uh, Python async IO so that we can do multiple checks at one time and check mirrors more frequently. Uh, used to, we were checking mirrors once per hour, and that left a pretty big window where a mirror could you know, drop offline or uh, get out of sync within that hour, but still get served to users. These days, we've got that down to 15 minutes, uh, which is a, you know, it, it leads to a much better user experience because we're able to, you know, make sure things are in sync a lot more often. Um, we start running into a few issues with the location-based serving that I was talking about with, with MaxMind data because we were doing it based on countries. So what we were doing is we were matching a user to a country. Uh, you know, say you're making a request from the U.S., we're going to serve you a list of U.S.-based mirrors first. Well, <laughs> we forgot to add any randomization to that list. So the same list for each country was getting served every single time. So in the U.S., let's say we have 30 mirrors, 50 mirrors, whatever. They're getting served in the exact same order every time. So what does that mean? We had two or three mirrors in the U.S. Uh, or, or in any given you know, large country just getting hammered while the rest of the you know, country's mirrors were sitting there doing nothing. That, that applies not just to the US, but any geographically large country or um, server dense country where you have a bunch of requests coming from a country where there's a bunch of mirrors, uh, you know, there, there would only be one or two taking those requests. The fix for that was relatively simple. When we generated the country-based lists, we simply said, hey, randomize this list. So that solves the issue of a few mirrors getting hammered in any given country. What that doesn't solve is within larger geographic countries, it does not serve good mirrors to those users. Um, you know, we could have a request coming from New York and we're serving a mirror in California. Sure, they're in the same country. Uh, and, and, you know, in a smaller country, like say, um, you know, Germany or Netherlands, where you've got a much tighter uh geographic spread and your infrastructure Canada and China and Australia 
that are really close to people. So one of the next things that we start looking at, uh, and I'm, I'm going a little out of order here, um, but the, the mirrorless generation code is pretty heavy. Uh, we are caching, uh, we're caching the mirrorless based on a source IP address, the repo, the architecture, and the version that it's requesting. What that means in a default Alma Linux install, you have three repositories enabled by default. You've got BaseOS, AppStream, uh, and Extras. So those three requests, while yes, they are cached, they don't get uh, the benefit of caching between each other because each one is uniquely cached based on that criteria that I mentioned. So we're going to improve that more later. Uh, that was an issue that we found at this point. Um, Another issue that that could lead to is you could be getting served different mirrors for different repositories within the operating system. So say BaseOS and AppStream, they very commonly have dependencies between each other. If we're serving two different mirrors, one, one for each of those, what can happen is you've got dependencies that don't exist on one mirror that are calling dependencies from the other. So we take care of that a little bit later, uh, and I'll, I'll cover that more in a minute. But that, that you know, again, I'm mostly covering issues that we were discovering at this point. Um, mirror flap detection is something that we added. And what that did is if a mirror had been going up and down, up and down, uh, at this point, we're still checking it once an hour. If it's flapping up and down, we don't want to trust that until we see that it's stable for a good amount of time. So we added something we called mirror flap detection. And what that would do is let us not serve a mirror if it hadn't been stable for X number of hours. I think at the time we had it set to six hours. So it would have to pass six uh, consecutive checks across all repositories that it hosts for us to consider it in good health. That helped uh, with serving dead mirrors a good bit. Um, talking back to the geolocation stuff and, and serving across a country, this is where we move to... Um, sorry, my words have left me. Uh, this is where we move to coordinate-based serving instead of country-based. So what we do is GeoIP will provide us with approximate coordinates of a... Uh, a given source IP address. Generally, that's you know accurate within a couple of hundred miles, which is perfectly fine for our needs. So we start using that data, and now if somebody's requesting a, a an update from say Bellingham, we're going to give them a mirror out of Seattle because we don't have mirrors in Bellingham, <laughs> you know, for example. But that's close enough that the the internet routes for that are going to be very high quality as opposed to somebody in Bellingham getting a mirror out of Florida. So that improves things a lot. Um, again, we had to revisit the randomization idea with that because we would get a bunch of mirrors in uh, like one particular area we had this was in Atlanta. We've, we had five or six mirrors in Atlanta and only a couple were serving traffic simply because of uh, the, the way MaxMind's GOIP data in its specificity, it would peg things like smack in the middle of Atlanta instead of being more um, accurate on like an actual address for it. And that's just the nature of, of GOIP. So what we had to do is go back and add a little bit of randomization within a, uh, I think we did a 500 kilometer radius, you know, within 500 kilometers of, of a given request, we're just going to randomize all the mirrors in that radius and serve all of those in random order every time um, to again, balance that traffic out. Um, not a ton happened in 2022 to the mirrorless code. At this point, things are chugging along pretty decent. We had four Alma Linux stable releases. Uh, we're well over, uh, I think, 250 mirrors at this point. Just minor tweaks and patches. Things are going pretty good. 2023, things start heating back up. So we get back to looking for efficiency improvements. Things are mostly working fine, but we're starting to run into more scaling issues and more minor quirks. The increase in users uh, of Alma Linux, you know, as time went on, meant that we had an increase in mirror list requests 
And the way the scaling worked at this point was individual VMs running the mirrorless. We had individual workers, uh, worker VMs, and they could all get slightly out of sync with each other. They were totally stateless and 100% independent of each other. So they each did their own checks of a mirror status. And because of that, each one of those could serve a slightly different mirror list depending on uh, each mirror's status at the time they did their status checks. That didn't really cause any huge issues, uh, but if you're looking at like the the public website of mirrors.almalinux.org and you hit you know refresh, 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 your list would change slightly, uh, and it it wasn't ideal. What we needed more was more frequent mirror list checks and consistent data shared between the VMs. Um, what that also meant with them being independent of each other is that the cache hits were not shared between the mirrorless workers. Uh, that was suboptimal as things continued to grow. We've got all these caches and we have insanely low cache hit rates. So we needed to improve that. Uh, and we also needed at this point to look at revisiting the fact that of, of how we were doing our caching. We were still doing it based on a combination of IP repository and architecture and version. So we've got these four things that have to align for a cache to actually be hit. So our hit rates were, you know, two or three uh, percent. Moving forward, we start working on some of this. We we move to a singular status checking VM. We take the status checking off of the workers completely. We put it over to the side, and we have a shared Redis cache. Uh, we used AWS Elastic Cache, and we get that cache shared between uh, all of the workers that starts helping our cache hit rates a little bit. Instead of caching based on IP address, repository version, um, and, and so on, we start caching strictly based on IP address. And we can do that because our mirror list checks, you've got to have all the architectures, you've got to have all the versions. We make sure that you have a full data set there. So there's no reason uh, that we can't cache just based on IP. We don't have to care about versions. We don't have to care about architecture. Doing that is the single most impactful thing that we did to the mirror system because we immediately required 75% fewer workers. Going back to the three uh, default repositories that are enabled that I mentioned, BaseOS, AppStream, and Extras. When you go do a, a DNF update or a YUM update, you're hitting all three of those repositories. Your first request, now that gets you cached. When you make when the next two requests are made, those return almost instantly because they're coming straight out of that cache without having to do the geolocation logic and the ASN logic and the subnet logic. We skip all of that. So instantly, things improved a ton, got faster updates to users and a much lighter, uh, leaner system. Then remember how I was saying, keep in mind about MaxMind earlier. This issue came up. Um, opened this issue in October of 2023 based on the report from a mirror owner. Uh, they had a one gig port. Their mirror was right around, uh, somewhere right around Kansas, Kansas City, Nebraska, somewhere right in there, right smack in the middle of the US. We get to looking at things. It took a couple of days to come to the conclusion. We realized that MaxMind thinks that, oh, about half of all internet traffic from the US is smack dab in the middle of the US. Because when they don't have specific data, when they don't know, say, a state for a requesting address, they just lump it right in the middle of the US. Um, even some European IPs and Australian IPs are getting, you know, pointed right smack in the middle of the US. So what does this look like? That's what it looks like. Um, if you know anything about the architecture and the setup of the internet backbone in the US, it doesn't look anything like this. The, the, the geographic center of the US is not an internet hotspot. So right, right there around Kansas, uh, you know, just a little bit southwest of Kansas City, we had over 50% of our requests were getting directed to mirrors in that area. So we had these four mirrors not near giant internet hubs because there's none there just getting inundated with this traffic 
So luckily one of these mirror owners brought it to our attention and, and after a few days of digging, we came to this conclusion. So we found MaxMind's GeoIP data to be subpar. So we start looking for solutions and we came across IP Info. They're a kind of a newer player to the GeoIP arena and using their data, this is what it looks like. We've got uh, on this particular one, we've got our, our mirrors overlaid with the, the little Alma Linux logo pins. But, you know, as you would expect, the the hotspot now for the U.S. is over there on the East Coast, uh, up north of Virginia, around New York. That's what you expect. That's a giant Internet hub. Uh, you know, all the major clouds have facilities right there. That That is, you know, long been one of the Internet hubs of the U.S. No surprise. If you look right there around uh, the center of Kansas, there is little to nothing. So... This un th this caused a bunch of mirrors to no longer be overloaded. Uh, users were getting faster downloads, and we have accurate data to use when we're looking to recruit new mirror owners. You know, say we do have a new hotspot pop up, and we only have you know one or two mirrors there. Now we have accurate data to say, okay, we need to find some more mirrors in this location. Uh, and this didn't just apply to the U.S. This applied in Canada. It applied in Russia. It applied in China. Any uh, geographically large country was disproportionately impacted by this, and were were more impacted than smaller, you know, European countries, for example. Um, and that's just because when, uh, you know, when you take a large country with a lot of mirrors like the U.S., when you hit the geographical center of it, the mirrors can be really far or really close. But when you take a small country uh, like Spain or France or Great Britain, you know you're going to have a lot more mirrors in that 500 kilometer radius that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so it, it's less impactful in the geographically small countries. So that's pretty much covering where we are now. Uh, since we fixed that, that data, we've got things running, uh, you know, pretty good right now. We can, you know, scale, like I said, we're doing almost three quarters of a million hits per hour. We're serving that efficiently. We're, we're only using about uh, 16 CPU cores to do that. And, and really only about eight because we keep it at about 50% load. Um, that auto scales up, you know, things are pretty smooth. So what's next? We need more statistics. Uh, we need to log what mirrors we are sending the most traffic to. Again, going back to being able to uh, know when we need to recruit more mirrors in a given area. We need to get the, the public heat maps like I just showed you. Uh, we need to get those public. That that code actually runs through mirrors.almalinux.org uh, in one of our dev environments. We just don't have that pushed live yet, but you know that's the kind of information that we want to make public. Uh, and then we intend to get some interactive Almalinux usage statistics uh, in something like Grafana. So we can you know track users and what architectures they're using. Um, and, and track is a really dangerous word. Um, We've got, you know, it's, it's all, it's, it's shot myself in the foot there. <laughs> um, we, we keep very anonymized data to people that will send it to us, um, which is basically, Hey, I'm on an Alma Linux system. I exist. And that's it. You know, there's, there's nothing personally identifying or anything like that. Um, we need a better development environment. Currently, the Alma Linux mirror system development environment is terrible. It's hard to get set up uh, because of the complexities of the system. And we can't expect people to contribute if we don't have an easy way to get the development environment up. Uh, developers, you know, it, it's written in Python. Python developers don't want to be fooling with uh, the system level stuff and intricacies to get it up and running. They just want to write Python. So we need to make that more accessible. We need protocol filtering. And by that, I just mean we've had requests. People want to be able to add to their, their uh, mirror list URLs and call only a list of HTTPS-based mirrors instead of uh, getting mirrors over HTTP. Reasonable request, pretty easy uh, to implement. We just need to get that done. Partial mirroring. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we require everybody to mirror all the versions and all the architectures. That works fine for a lot of people. Uh, some people that want to set up a mirror might not have the disk space or resources to do that. Say they have a vested interest in x86 or in ARM, and they only want to mirror that one architecture. 
we don't want to reject them as a mirror simply because they only want to do a partial mirror. So currently the checking scripts look for everything to be there and be present. Uh, we need to update those so that we can log and serve partial mirrors uh, when that's possible. We need to improve our mirror validation a little bit more. Uh, right now we look for a timestamp file. We look for a couple of other key files that works 99.9% .9 of the time. We've had a couple of cases where mirrors can get out of sync in a weird way uh, and you end up with uh, essentially the result is 404s in your updates because they're serving outdated metadata. Uh, so then when yum or DNF goes to look for the actual package, it, it's, it's an old URL. So we need to start validating those repo data files and we need to look at more efficient ways, faster ways to do the validation. Uh, we could look at doing that with rsync if mirrors want to enable it. Uh, and that could let us avoid a whole bunch of web requests, do it faster and more efficient. Um, so we're always looking for contributors. There's a few different ways to get involved, specifically with the mirror system. Um, you can go to mirrors.almalinux.org. There are links on how to set up a mirror. There are links on uh, how to get to the GitHub repositories and how to join the foundation as an individual or mirror sponsor. And that's what I've got. Hey, thank you. Yeah, it's fantastic. So honest feedback for the first time. How was that? <laughs> <laughs> pretty seamless yeah uh a lot of lot of information like uh there was definitely some aha moment moments with that uh, geographic reveal so like you know building up that tension and uh that was uh it was a good good presentation let's say submit it to the uh to any 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 conference uh you want to um as far as uh questions go do you open for um what were the you mentioned the three repo types earlier. What were those again? Uh, the application. I was trying to get called. Yeah. So by default, the the content within Alma Linux or with any Linux distro distro really is split up. Um, in Alma Linux and Red Hat and Rocky and CentOS Stream, the defaults that are going to be enabled are Base OS, App Stream, and Extras. Um, there's other repositories you can add. Uh, there's a, uh, like Apple, uh, E-P-E-L, that's a third-party repository. Uh, there's some other core ones you can enable, like debug info repositories and source repositories and things like that. So um, in, in Alma Linux, uh, I guess the next most common repositories that we'd see would be um, Power Tools and CRB for, for Alma Linux 8 and 9, respectively. So... Anybody that has those enabled, the savings from that, those caching improvements just increase, you know, linear to those repositories. Uh, so 75% was kind of our baseline. In reality, it was a little bit higher, um, you know, as far as the improvement was a little bit better, uh, simply for people that that did also use those other repositories. Okay, right. thanks. For the uh, the dev environment setup, um, have you uh, started looking into like dev containers or containerized development environments? I haven't yet. Um, I know Vagrant is going to be one that we probably look at because we've already got some experience with it. Uh, I don't really personally, but but some of the other um, active Alma Linux contributors do. So I'm sure we'll look at Vagrant. Um, we could probably look at like some some Docker Podman images. I'm not sure exactly what that will look like. Uh, <laughs> I just know that it, it needs to improve. Yeah. So, and actually, that that's a conclusion I came to while I was creating these slides uh, and and working on the slide for like how to contribute. I was like, huh, this is really bad. We need to fix this. So yeah, it's a pr pretty new aha for me. Nice. Yeah. They, I mean, a lot of those growing pains kind of go across you know infrastructure or projects or you know mm -hmm. how do you how do you load balance all of this stuff to uh to uh, get information uh all the caching and things so yeah uh, food for thought i liked it yeah like i said there's there's so much more i mean i could easily make this an hour hour and a half talk like there there's so much more to cram in there and i, I see the timing was 
just about perfect, but man, it was kind of hard to run through it uh, that quick. Nice. Well, that, yeah, then the sequel is going to be, uh, yeah, extended version. Uh, we'll we'll uh, look that look that talk up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Nice. Cool. Stop recording.